This is Investment Community with me, Justin Newdigate, in conversation with the most insightful players in the financial market ecosystem. My special guest today is Dave Ford. Dave is CIO of Ford Asset Management, a firm that he founded way back in 1981. He began his investment career in the late 1970s with a three-year stint as an industrial analyst at Old Mutual. Dave is a student of economic history and apparently he's pretty good at sailing and bridge. This is the second of two episodes of our wide-ranging conversation. So Dave, you've spoken about the disruption underway in various industries such as healthcare and energy. In what ways do you foresee the global investment industry being disrupted? I don't think the global investment industry is going to be disrupted in that sense. And yet it is. It's being disrupted all the time. But I'd rather than say disrupted, I would say it's evolving. You know, when I came into the industry, it was very nascent. There was hardly anything involved. The pensions were run by the accountant they were trying to push out of the way and put in a back office somewhere and gave him the pension fund as a sort of promotion to manage. Um, things have evolved a lot since then. So it's an industry that's more in the growth phase than in the mature phase, which is where disruption comes in. Yeah, it let, leads to its own own issues. It's an industry with a lot of money, and if you want to attract the wrong sort of people, then that's the sort of industry that does that. So the regulation is not doing the right thing in terms of, of fixing that. If anything, it's making it worse. The disruption that we're seeing has been one of scale, which you would expect in any industry. So scale begins a, a lower a cost, uh, which then gets passed on to the consumer, and then those with scale get more scale, more scale in any industry until you get an oligopoly and maybe even a monopoly. And then you get the mama's home-baked pie story again with the little guys come out and start doing it. And to, to some extent, I was supposed that I was that little guy disrupting the, um, with a few others, obviously, disrupting the status quo of the life offices, which were dominating the savings industry in, in South Africa when we started. But there's different levels of, the, of, of this industry. Um, there's room for the micro guys. There's room for the traders. There's, there's room for all sorts of uh, product creation. So scale will continue to be an issue. Yeah, it's, it's evolving. Um, it's fascinating to watch how it evolves. I suppose partly why I'm talking a, a, around a bit is that I don't have a refined, definitive answer of how it unfolds from here. But you're going to continue to get scaling up and you're going to continue to get little guys coming in um, at, at different levels on a, on, a, on a global basis. You're seeing new product things like the ETF. So we had the, the new products of, all, all pro new products come in all the time. The old fashioned closed in funds that were listed were, were completely disintermediated mutual funds are coming. Maybe the mutual fund industry is also um, getting quite long in the tooth. Um, and we started to get some, some comments on that. Um, the hedge funds haven't made the complete disruption that you might have expected. But the interesting thing on the hedge funds is that they were against the main trend of a race to the bottom in terms of price. The hedge funds proved that people can charge ridiculous amounts of money um, even for the prospect of a decent return, even if the decent return wasn't there. So that's passed and gone. And then we've seen the opposite of that is trying to cut fees with um, ETFs. And again, the industry being an um, industry I'm not proud of, jumps on the bandwagon and sells ETF at ludicrously high prices because they brand it as ETF and therefore they brand it as supposedly cheap. And then now you've got an ETF for anything. So now you've got too many choices on ETFs, just as we had too many choices on mutual funds. Two main elements in investing on asset allocation and selection. And 
the sell side has been very good at obfuscating and making it very difficult for the consumer to decide the right product for him by creating so many different choices and taking away the asset allocation decision. The big disruptor in the future will be in be an all-in product which people can buy, which explains exactly what's on the can. So the, the industry is ripe for that. Um, and yet there's no sign that that's going to be happening in the short term because there's too much money to be had by obfuscation and um, creating products which people don't really need. Um, the best, the sell side is very good. That's to make sure people buy products that they're going to have to sell. So they get two trades out of it. And there's a lot of noise, as you know, in the industry around this, urging people to do something when, in fact, they don't need to do much at all. So it's an interesting industry. It's, a, it's an immature industry. It's not a mature industry. So there's lots of scope for growth and innovation, and that will continue. It seems you're describing bifurcation within this maturing process where you get the few, the, the oligopoly emerging because of scale and that allowing for the mom and pop shops to arise in the space that's left, perhaps, you know, in a, in a niche area. It seems to me then, if that is the case, that where you don't want to be, if you're, if you're in, the, in the business, is in the, middle, in the middle ground where you're neither niche nor scale. <laughs> In any industry, the middle ground is the one that gets eaten up. How do you avoid getting into the middle ground if you start as a small shop? Well, middle ground is, is conceptual as well. You can be in the middle ground and succeed if you've got a product which is needed. So hmm. if you're in the industry as an asset gatherer or if you're in the industry just because you're in the industry, well, then you have already lost. And being in the middle ground is irrelevant. You'll probably end up in the middle ground for that reason. But whether you're small or large or in the middle, if you're adding value, then you have a raisin to it, which is robust, as simple as that. So the, the South African industry follows these, the global trends in the industry quite closely. What do you see as challenges that might be unique to, to investment firms who, who are located or investing in South Africa? Well, let's just go back to your assumption that the South African mm. industry follows, follows the global industry. Okay, fair enough. It, it, it does and it doesn't, um, and regulation has made sure that it doesn't in some ways, and the incumbents make sure it doesn't in other ways. So the hedge funds didn't take off in South Africa. There are um, Cetrix, et cetera, uh, there's a limited number of ETFs in, in South Africa that they, they do exist, but a lot of other things that have happened in the global stage um, are not happening in, in S. But the SA is an open economy. It has had an advanced financial system, and that advanced financial system has um, you know, copied the plethora of mutual funds and other things like that, which have, which have happened on the global stage. But it also hasn't copied usage. Um, there's a lot of things happening internationally which, which don't happen in, in, in SA. So at some stage, it, it, in some ways, it is actually a protected bubble. I'd like to touch on the whole question of regulation in a moment because I can, I can feel it emerging there. But perhaps if we're going to stay with challenges that you feel that would be unique to South African investors, not so much the firms themselves and the, and the business of, of, of investing, but the, the actual investing in markets them, themselves. What, what challenges are unique to South African investors, if any? The main purpose in, in investing is, is what? You know, to, for some people, it's to make money. For other people, it's to preserve capital. For other people, it's to get a um, retirement uh, income, so to get a future income stream. So lots of people are in it for, for different reasons. And whether it's global or local, there are two main threats to either accumulation of wealth or to uh, preserving your wealth. And one is taxation and the other is inflation. You need to be aware of those things and you need to understand what the future is likely to be on taxation and what the future is likely to be on inflation. And that's a global issue um, and a South African issue as well. You know, governments that are, are needy and run budget deficits are more likely to tax. And unfortunately, savings are ripe for taxation because rule number one in taxation is don't tax people with no money. It's a threat to the SA industry. Would you care to weigh in on 
on the whole question of inflation. I mean, it's a it's a highly traversed, highly discussed area. Is, it, is there something you'd like to add to that that discussion, Dave, on, on prospects for inflation? Well, it's, it's something we something we focus on and we worry about the most because mm. we target inflation plus five percent um, as a good score. And that plus 5%, I suppose, is your margin of safety on the fact that the disclosed inflation number may not be your inflation number, and it covers a whole lot of other issues like that. Um, and, you know, that's what we've achieved internationally. We've achieved um, CPI plus 5% in US dollars. And locally, you know, we've achieved CPI plus 10% in, in rands uh, over the period. And that's you know, that's our benchmark, not what the peers are doing, not what the, the market's doing. That's what we believe we should be focusing on, is real returns um, for our investors. You know, the inflation debate, is it coming? Yes, it's, for sure it's coming. Um, we've got this open financial system, and therefore we do import a lot of what's happening globally, and inflation globally gets imported very quickly. We also have a currency which, like most fiat currencies, is on its way to zero eventually. And the way the government's carrying on and overspending and the lack of efficiency with that spending, um, the currency is likely to weaken. And that, that currency um, is probably going to 100, um, eventually to 1,000. All fiat currencies go to naught um, eventually. And it's not just an African thing. It happens in South America. It happens in Europe. All the liras and the pesos in Europe, they all went to naught um, eventually. And so governments don't, and it happens because governments don't control or balance their, their budget. Um, and that's clearly what's happening in SA at the moment. And that will bring inflation as well. So you've got the global open thing of the global inflation happening because the United States is also not controlling the situation and starting to print money. That'll create inflation, but also within South Africa, you've got a, um, a direct cause of inflation outside of that. So with those two main parameters, um, inflation is going to be a major problem in the next 20 years. And so as investors with long time horizon, we need to worry about that and focus on that. I'm somewhat surprised by the way you're speaking about fiat currency. Am I, am I hearing you softly whispering crypto by saying fiat goes to zero? Let me be very clear. Mm. Crypto is a con, and one can describe gold as a con too. But no, I'm not an advocate of crypto. I understand a lot about why people like it, um, being quite anti-establishment myself. And But it is like fiat currency. It's, um, it works if everybody believes. So let's move to the kind of a subset of the industry, the pensions industry. How, how well is this industry in its current form serving the interests of current and future pensioners? There's a lot of good happening. First of all, there is a savings pool. And South Africa's got something that very few countries have got, and that's a, a funded, used to be fully funded, um, potentially fully funded pension scheme for government employees. So that's on the balance sheet. Instead of being a liability on the balance sheet, it's an asset on the balance sheet in South Africa's case. Uh, and that's a big distinguishing factor for, for South Africa. So you need to include that in it. On the corporate side, not everybody in South Africa works for a corporate, and so therefore there's a lot of people that don't have a pension. So there's a big gap. The social benefits are covering that gap. Um, to a greater or lesser extent. So now we've got on, now we have the introduction of a welfare stroke pension liability that is not funded. So therein lies partly a problem which needs to be resolved in some way or another. The corporate side and then the savings side, the life offices have been um, great in creating a big savings pool. And that's wonderful. But you've got the normal problem of the world that people don't save enough and it's behavioral science stuff. They put it off. Um, it won't happen to them. They'll always be able to be okay. Um, and of course, we've got the added problem more recently that people are living not just a little bit longer, but 10, 15, 20 years longer. 
that's something that needs to be taken into account. So the savings pool is not enough. You'll be aware of it. The direct ability of people to manage their own pension, I think, is a good thing. But it also has another side to it, the people accessing their money faster than perhaps they should. Right. So you see people drawing 10%, 11%, 12%, and the money will run out. Um, they need to be drawing 5% or less if they want to make sure that their, their savings last their lifetime. And they're not. They, they're drawing faster. And there's a problem there for the economy. There's a problem there for the savings industry. Um, and how that, how that gets resolved, um, well, it doesn't. <laughs> Going forward, I don't think a lot of the youth in the broader spectrum of South Africa are as keen on saving as their parents were. So we've got structural problems in the, in the savings industry, in the pension industry um, in South Africa. Um, and we're seeing it just in the, the age profile of the IFAs, there's, there's, a, there's not a culture of saving. So we're seeing the pension industry in South Africa is mature. There's more money coming out of pensions than going into savings. And that does not meet the demographic profile of the country. So there's a problem in the future. Yeah, so it's a well-articulated problem. Uh, uh, and it's a, a broad social one that's coming down the pike. I'm wondering at a more micro level, if one could put it that way, what, what opportunities that might present, if any, for a firm like Ford Asset Management? We did look at intervening at different stages, um, getting a life license in order to provide a much more efficient retirement annuity um, at our risk and our higher return and therefore disrupt the market by providing a better return, passing on that um, better return from us to a better yield on the annuity. We made the decision not to go ahead. Could you elaborate? <laughs> I can. Um, but it's to do with the politics and the longevity and the way regulation was developing and the amount of capital that one would have to allocate to it even on a generous basis of wanting to give something back to the country, et cetera, et cetera. It was not a, a risk worth taking. So it seems we've looped back to tangentially to regulation, which I understand for... I, I, wonder, I wonder why. Maybe it's like chicken <laughs> man. <is> it? <laughs> yeah, no, we're not going to avoid it any longer. Let's go there. So... S such a huge burden on firms now compared to say 20 years ago, and that's globally as well. Um, a, a massive burden on, on individual firms and, and perhaps also created some barriers to entry. So at, at best a mixed blessing. What, what's your sense of what the regulators are getting right and what are they getting wrong? Well, the immediate reaction is, are they getting anything right? Um, and you don't have enough time for me to list all the things that they're getting wrong. But who's regulating the regulators? Who's scoring the regulator? If you look at malfeasance or criminal activity, that has grown. It hasn't gone down. The extra cost is enormous at lots of different levels. So from a user perspective, there's no advantage, no improvement in, in, in safety. And there's a huge cost. You know, when we started, there was no need for a license even. We could open our doors as a professional. And life is like this. If you're in a small village, your reputation is important. With a poor reputation, you can't make a living. In the big city, unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be the case. So in theory, the regulator is providing safety and comfort and reputation. It doesn't do that. And your point that it creates barriers to entry is, is again, I go back to that assumption and say, well, is it, is it really or so? It certainly wasn't an unintended consequence. The committees I was on in my early stages of the industry, there were people from the life offices and vested interests were on these committees to ensure that nothing changed 
or if there was a change, it would be to entrench their interests. So a lot of these regulations are actually deliberately designed to make it more difficult for entry. On the other hand, what has happened and it was difficult in the past for us to get that mutual fund license, as I mentioned earlier, mutual fund licenses are pretty available these days. So there has been some opening up to competition there, despite the vested interest not wanting that. So some things have, have happened that way. But the regulator himself is seen by the bureaucrats as an important way of creating more jobs. And this is on a global basis, not just an SA basis. And gets adopted very easily because people want to, politicians want to create more jobs for the economy. So this is an extra tax that the industry is having to pay with no benefit. And at the same time, the industry is starting to mature and therefore the income side, the fee side is coming down and the costs are going up. Yeah. That in itself is creating a problem in terms of competition. And there needs to be a lot more co uh, consolidation in the industry. And we're starting to see a little bit of consolidation at the top end, not from the bottom end. But the smaller shops and the smaller mutual funds um, must be running at a loss. And I'm surprised that there isn't a fading away. Stroke. The consolidation can come by people merging, um, but it can also come by the smaller shops uh, folding. Now the shops fold, but the mutual funds don't fold. So the number of mutual funds is ridiculous. Um, and again, that's an inefficiency in the system. It does help to have competition, to have more, more mutual funds. So it's a difficult, as, as in most things, difficult to get the right balance. And is the regulator even trying to get the right balance? No, not. The regulator is just trying to create more jobs. That to being successful now. And somebody's got to pay for that. Unfortunately, the pension is paid. Some of the regulations, like Reg 28, is forcing a certain asset allocation. Now, that allocation is a very important decision, as, as we've covered before. Now, why should the regulator tell us what the asset allocation decision should be? That cannot be efficient. On the one hand, it, forcing people out of just being in cash and forcing people into a more stable asset allocation, I suppose, can actually be advantageous to, to the pensioner. But no, um, there's lower returns, and we worked it out. I mean, we've got funds which are not regulated. We've got funds which are regulated. We've worked out that the difference, the lower return is about 2% per annum because of the forced Reg 28. So... Wow, that's a big number. You compound that over 20 years. It's, yeah. it's material. Yeah. Yes. Um, but, yeah. And the industry has evolved. I think some of the costs that the life officers were putting on annuities and things like that were, were ridiculous. And the sales commissions and things like that on some of their policies. You know, we're going back to, you know, upfront fees on mutual funds. They've come out. The competition has taken those things away, not the regulator. But the industry has improved um, from some burdens which were over 5% per annum um, to burdens which are now somewhere between 2 and 3% per annum with some of those um, in-house products. And without that, you can actually get the cost down to below 2%. They should be lower. They should be a lot lower. And maybe we'll get there. Um, but the industry has shown that um, people are prepared to pay, um, pay 1% or 2%. So you've got this race to the bottom in some things. And in other areas, people are actually prepared and want that actual personal service and other things and, um, for which they're prepared to pay. So it's an interesting um, situation. It's going to be fascinating to see how it evolves over the next 10, 20 years. It almost seems like you're saying there's potentially a commoditization of product and where the, the value might lie is in, in relationship. 100% agree with that. If that's what's going to keep the, the smaller shops going is the relationship. Is there more you'd like to say on a regulation? I bet there is. There's tons of more you could say. There were two occasions in the last 15 years where I've gone and 
highlighted criminal activity to the regulator. And on both occasions, the regulator did nothing. On the one occasion, the first occasion, explained that he didn't have jurisdiction, which I disagree with. And on the second occasion, they were aware of it, they were dealing with it, and I waited for something to happen, and they didn't do anything about it. It sort of faded into obscurity. That comes down to the thing, it's all very well to have regulation and laws, but if you're not policing them, what's the point of having them in the first place? So that's very sad. What's your sense of what was behind that, that abject failure of, of execution? I find it difficult to say in this format. Mm -hmm. um, one has one's suspicions this way and that. I have a very strong belief in the integrity of the individual I was speaking to. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't that at all. Mm -hmm. It was a frustration on their part that the law was not backing them up on what they wanted to do. Let's shift focus to something that we spoke about earlier. Um, not necessarily a, a more fun subject, but I think one that will be terribly interesting is you spoke earlier about the, the pressure that comes with underperformance day. And you specifically mentioned the period of 98, 99, which was a rough old patch. What, what contributed to this period of performance and how did you deal with the pressure? Well, pressure came in different forms and then performance was actually very short lived. Lucky for us. I mean, in the industry, it's like three strikes and you're out. Yeah. We work on a calendar type system, rightly or wrongly. And one bad year, you can survive. Two bad years, you're on warning. And three bad years, you're out um, if they're consecutive. The pressure that we were feeling was that in the short term, people were making um, hay while the market was rising and the dot com bubble and all the exuberance of that. And we were warning and saying that the market's expensive and we didn't want to participate in it. And we started to lose funds because we weren't participating in it. In terms of the actual pressure and funds flying out from us, it wasn't that because our a period of underperformance wasn't long enough, although we were getting, we were losing money because we weren't participating in our daughter, et cetera. Yeah. It was marginal. The big outflow of funds that I referred to earlier was more structural change in the industry. We had purposely diversified so that the actuarial consultants um, with us and we were turning business away, et cetera, in the 90s, we made sure that no, not more than 20% of our assets came from any one actuarial consultant. And then three of them merged. Yeah. <laughs> and suddenly more than 50% of our assets were with one consultant. Yeah. And then those consultants decided to have a multi-manager system. And we didn't have a brand. And we were told very clearly that Mifro Fontana, who was a domain lead, did not understand Ford. And therefore, they cannot allocate assets to Ford. And therefore, money that we did have that was going to go into, into the multi-asset structures, Ford didn't have a slot. And they needed the excuse of underperformance and the underperformance, I'll give you the numbers. We were just in the cusp of the bottom quartile on the year with a score of 4.8%. The median score for the year was something like 6.8 and the top score for the year was 7.4. And that was enough to say we were underperforming and therefore etc. The combination of those things. But how did we take the pressure? We did take the pressure on the chin and debated it and said we cannot live with ourselves if we turn and go with the momentum and buy the die doctors, etc. And we'd rather have our reputation than the assets. So we told the people you can take the assets to somebody else and lose them, which is exactly what happened. Um, but we're not going to change it and have it on our conscience that we bought overvalued assets at the trustees. And it came, it, it, it was exactly like that. They said, we want to stay with you, but you need to be joining the party. And we said, no, we're not. Yeah. We'd rather lose assets. So it's a, it's a conviction and a belief. And um, I think it's a, I'd like to believe it's an integrity thing. It's, it's so interesting. We speak, we've spoken at length about diversification at multiple levels. We're talking about diversification of, 
at the multi councillor level, at asset level. But it was interesting, you're talking almost at the liability level um, that you're diver attempting to diversify there as well with 20% a cap on, yeah. on one actor no, we, consultant. No, we were very early on, we were aware of the risk of over concentration. Yeah. Do, do you feel you were rewarded for that um, preserving of integrity and turning away assets? I think so. Strangely enough, uh, indirectly over time. Yeah. Um, I believe our shop has a reputation for doing the right thing and being a safe pair of hands. It wasn't there at that time, but it has evolved over time. Yeah. And I think that's, uh, that's a message for, for other people in terms of the shops and things like that. It, it takes more than 10 years. There's a, there's a, there's a shop around, um, and they'll probably have a little chuckle on this one. But when that shop started, they came to me and I was quite happy to mentor them. And I said, it's going to take you 10 years before you know whether you succeeded or not. And on the 10th anniversary, they came and took me to lunch and say, well, I didn't believe you at the time, but it's now 10 years. And only now can we say that we've succeeded. Yeah, it's a long and experiment, isn't it? It's not an experiment, it's real life. It's real life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you feel there's there's any echo now, Dave, of what was happening 98, 99? Do you have a sense of the same sort of dynamics at play in the market? History rhymes. It doesn't uh, repeat. So there's a lot of semblance of that. But no, that exuberance was on growth in a new era. A little bit like the railroads and, and things like that. Um, this this is this is being generated um, partly in the in the tech, but it wasn't so long ago that the tech stocks were actually value stocks and very cheap. The financial repression we're going through now with negative real interest rates is very destructive to the global economy and very destructive to sensible decision making in the investment industry. So they've taken away the yardstick of the risk-free return. And now we're getting return-free risk and it's terrible and it's a problem. If your, your, your cap rate is your interest rate, and I told you earlier that you know, interest rates are very really fundamental to the way we, we operate and forecast interest rates to enable us to get asset levels and therefore asset return levels over three, five, seven years. If you're dividing by naught, what's an asset worth? It's a problem. So that, that's, the, that's the issue now. It's a completely different problem to the, to the 2000 problem. Mm. So going back to that 2000 problem, what, what else did you learn from that episode, your, your survival of that episode? What did you translate into corporate knowledge? <laughs> well, you just have to be right. And you not only have to be right, you have to be right at the right time. There are times that you need to be aware that you are going to be out of step with consensus and consensus is often wrong so get used to the fact that it's very uncomfortable being right how do you manage that discomfort perhaps also manage the people it's much, around easier, you. it's much easier now in terms of having had the experience of lived through it through multiple cycles and also seeing that the crowd is so wrong so often yeah uh, it almost builds, uh, unfortunately, an arrogance in it, which is which is not right. Um, but the communicating it and getting it in the team, the bigger the team, the more the debate on these issues. Um, but I think it's more an understanding of these horses for courses and there's people who want to play the momentum game and the people who want to play the value game and the people who want to play the factor game if you want to do all these different things. and understanding that none of them work all the time. Right. And, you know, that's why we're quite eclectic in the way we manage money and we, we're trying to get on to the, the method that's working um, and is more robust through the cycle and not pick on the method that's working at the moment because it will fail soon. So recognize why it's working and understand how long it's going to last and, and make sure that you're not carrying the the parcel when the music stops. So it strikes me that you have 
perhaps innate temperament to deal with discomfort. You, you don't look like you shy away from discomfort in the slightest day. And you've had 40 no. plus years to, to develop. No, but was, I think it was always there. As I yeah. say, right in the early stages, we understood that the market was made up of lots of people and the prices there and that the crowd is wrong and the crowd is all going for this efficient market hypothesis, which was so obviously wrong. Mm. So the facts pointed to that. So the facts, you know, if the market is generally on a 10 PE and it's now trading on a 20 PE, the facts stand up for themselves. The opinion is not that important. And for the people around you who perhaps have um, less robust temperaments or less experience, well, how do you help them cope? That's been the harder part is having, because we've got uh, different people in, uh, from different backgrounds and different temperaments, because mm. uh, it's important to have a team of different people. Um, not all of them um, are comfortable with that. Yeah. Um, so guiding them through that is, is part of what I need to do. That feels to me like the antithesis of, of work from boat. You, know, you are guiding people through difficult patches. Well, the communications, you know, as we're communicating now, that's how I communicate with office and have been for the last 20 years. So yeah. I give myself the free time to think, but I also give my time to, to mentor. Um, and I enjoy mentoring. And, um, yeah, it's an important thing to do. Through the duration of our conversation, you mentioned luck. You mentioned that you've been lucky. I do say that you made your own luck, Dave. So in what ways have you made yourself lucky? You know, luck is a very important thing to have. And it comes in different forms. You can, you know, the harder you, harder you work or practice, as Gary Player said, mm -hmm. then the luckier you get. That's absolutely true. Or there's luck in that you've got a 50-50 call and you make the right call. Um, I've been lucky that way. Um, particularly being in the right spot at the right time. Even though you've been in this game for longer than many of our audience have been alive, you still seem very enthusiastic about markets and investing, as enthusiastic as someone early in their career. Given that you're not early in your career, what ambitions do you still have, Dave, for yourself and for your firm? Uh, it's, it's an, I am enthusiastic about it. I love it. And again, that's what I'm lucky that I found found something that I, that I really enjoy. And I enjoy it because it's difficult. I mean, it really is difficult. I don't have the answer yet. I'm still trying to find a simple answer to this game. I'm learning all the time. Um, and I love it. It's, um, it's great. So I've got no... Um, it's a hobby. I retired uh, 40 years ago to to manage money. I didn't have any of my own, so I had to manage other people's money. Now I've got other people's money and the responsibility to continue and uh, more than enough of my own. And so I'll carry on managing money because I enjoy it. It's a hobby. And I'll try and do it the best way I can um, and get the best re results for the least risk and understand the risks and get the survival and all those things. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm loving it. And the ambitions for Ford Asset Management, what are those? Well, I've got some really bright people, both in South Africa and Singapore. They're brighter than me, most of them. And it's really a pleasure to have them on board. The shop must survive me. That's, a, that's the main thing because we've got uh, investors that uh, will be around. Um, I feel a loyalty to, to those investors. So... The priority is to ensure we continue getting that um, CPI plus X uh, for our investors with the new team. The sustainability, you need the assets to do that. On the international side, we need to get some non-SA assets uh, into, the, into the international funds so that we, again, diversify uh, the shop risk so that there's um, assets there, the income, uh, to keep the, um, the bright people and to get more bright people uh, into working. But it's essentially more of the same. We want to be a small shop um, looking after a, a few people, those people that trust us with their money and giving them the best service and, and the best returns. Don't want to be too large. 
um, in terms of either assets or people. And we wanted to deliver the best, put the best score on the board. And mm -hmm. if the shop can do that after I'm gone, then I'll be very pleased. Now that's an okay legacy, right? That's what I would like. Dave, drawing on your deep pool of knowledge and experience, all the wisdom you have, what advice would you give to someone who's just starting out in their investment career? Definitely do it. What you need to do is pick your own path. Don't try and copy others. Understand your own makeup, your own psychology. As you are aware, because some of your questions were directed this way, and understanding pressure and different things like that. So if you're a conservative person, then construct yourself a conservative style. If you're an aggressive gambler, then be careful. But, uh, you know, by all means, go into, into that aggressive, aggressive style. So don't copy and try and paste what you learn from the ivory towers or from the books and things like that. So read the books and understand the other players for what they are and what they do. But you need to understand yourself more. If you try and copy somebody else's style, either my style or Buffett's style or Templeton style way of doing things, it's not going to work as well as if you create your own. You need to live within your own parameters because if you, the tension that comes when you're wrong and you're going to be wrong a lot will make you make a bad decision if you don't understand yourself. So first of all, know thyself. Know thyself. And apply it um, and live within your means. If you spend less than you earn, you'll always be happy and you'll be able to survive. And so long as you can survive in this game, you're still playing the game. And it's not about level. It's not about assets or things like that. It's about being in the game. And to, fir to finish first, first you must finish. And learn as much as you can. Read as much as you can about everybody and everything and successful methods but make your own method and, and your own path. That would be my advice. Yeah, know thyself. Mm -hmm. It's been said before in different contexts, hasn't it? But it remains true and it's maybe particularly true in the investment game because if you don't, I think this is what you're saying, the market will tell you who you are or who you're not. Correct. The market is, uh, is very vicious. This is a, understand that this is not a friendly society. Mm -hmm. This is a jungle. This is a Darwinian system. And if you don't adapt, if you don't provide value, the market will chew you up and spit you out. Survivor of the fittest. Perhaps on that cheery note, um, we can um, begin to draw our conversation to a close. What final comments would you like to make to, to draw this to a satisfactory close? I think we've covered a lot of it, Justin. Um, thank you for listening. And I hope it's um, been worthwhile. Well, Dave, my sincere thanks to you for this incredible contribution to the investment community. Thank you for your time. Thanks for listening. You can sign up for more of my podcasts as well as my newsletters at newdigate.substack.com. Until next time.